Before we get started with the video, I need to thank this video's sponsor once again, Surfshark VPN. With the holiday season in full swing, tons of new shows and movies are coming to many different streaming platforms. However, if you don't live in certain regions, you may not have access to all this new content. This is something you can get around by having a VPN through Surfshark. A VPN is a virtual private network, and having one is great for keeping your time online safe and secure. But another great reason to have a VPN through Surfshark is the ability to change the region in which you are accessing the internet from. Doing this allows you to get around region-blocked shows and movies so that you can start watching more of the content you enjoy. Because of all this, I highly recommend that you try Surfshark out. In fact, if you do so now and use the promo code SHOGUNATE, you can receive 83% off and 4 extra months free as part of their Christmas special offer. So, what are you waiting for? Don't miss out on this amazing deal on your very own VPN. But with that said, let's get on to the video. This month, on my Patreon poll to decide my next Samurai Clan history video, my Patreon supporters voted for me to cover the Mori Clan. And before we go any further, I am talking about the Mori family from Aki Province, not the Mori family that would have such members as Mori Ranmaru. There is a difference, as these are both separate clans, and in this video I am choosing to cover the more famous of the Mori families. Now, the fascinating thing about the Mori of Aki is that although they can trace their lineage far back into history, they really do not become relevant until the Sengoku Jidai, with the rise of the famous Mori Motonari. And even after the Sengoku period, they would continue to be a very influential force, even leading into the Bakumatsu era. Plenty can be said about their dominance of the West, powerful naval presence, and later, of course, their involvement in the Boshin War. So, with that said, let's dive in and discover the interesting tale of the Mori. The origins of the Mori date all the way back to a figure named Oe no Suemitsu. Now, Suimitsu was the fourth son of Oe no Hiramoto, a samurai leader who appears to have been descended from the Fujiwara family, but had gone on to become a staunch Minamoto loyalist, aiding in the establishment of the first shogunate in Kamakura. Hiramoto would be gifted land by the shogunate, with one location in the Kanto region known as Morinosho. It would be Morinosho that would later be inherited by his fourth son, Suimitsu. And from there, Suimitsu would go on to establish his own branch of the family, taking the Mori from the first part of the name of his land. Now, here's a quick note on pronunciation, something I normally don't ever talk too much about. It is believed that the original pronunciation of the name was simply Mori, but would later be changed to make the O vowel elongated so that it would sound more like Mori. And although saying Mori is the correct way to pronounce the name, honestly, don't worry about that. If you want to pronounce it as Mori or Mori, that is totally fine. In fact, if you're ever worried about sounding dumb in front of someone who is actually Japanese, if you are saying Mori or any other samurai-related word for that matter, believe me when I say not to be too concerned about that. Trust me, the Japanese usually understand what you are talking about regardless. But getting back to Suimitsu, or now as we can call him Mori Suimitsu, he had become a Jito, a form of deputy land governor under a Shugo. And after the brief Jokyu War in 1221, when the Emperor Gotoba sought to return to power, Suimitsu would be awarded additional territory in Aki province. And although things were looking up for Suimitsu and his line of the family, he would later decide to support the Miura family in a conflict against the Hojo regents of the Kamakura shogunate. They would ultimately be defeated, causing him to commit seppuku in 1247. After this, his land would be divvied up between his heirs, with his second son, Mori Tokichika, receiving the territory in Aki. And although some might say this is really where the Aki branch of the Mori family started, other times the starting of the Aki branch is attributed to a later descendant, Mori Chikahara, who is said to have been the one to actually fully move the family to Aki. Whatever the case, by the 14th century, the Aki branch of the Mori family was in full swing, as they had remained as Jito of the small area to the north of the province, 
ruling from Yoshida Koriyama Castle. Right here you might be asking, so if they were just deputy rulers of a portion of Aki, who was actually the main ruler of Aki by this point? And if you have watched my History of the Takeda Clan video, you would know that by the 1300s it was the Takeda family who still ruled over Aki, and would continue to do so for another couple of centuries. From here, they play sort of a backseat role to much of the major developments in Japan for a while. During the Genko War and later rise of the Ashikaga, it is said that the Mori backed Takauji in his establishment of the new shogunate in Kyoto, and later they would back the Ochi clan in the Onin War. By the 1400s, the Ochi had become one of the strongest powers in western Honshu, and once the Onin War had broken out, they would soon declare their support for the Yamana clan against their Hosokawa rivals. As we know, however, after a decade of fighting, neither the Yamana or Hosokawa would really prevail, and instead, by 1477, with the country in flames, we enter into the era of the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's iconic age of warring states, where samurai lords across the land fought over regional dominance. And to this, the small Mori family of Aki would be no exception. However, their rise would not initially come from general ambition, but rather from opportunity along with the sheer genius of an up-and-coming figure named Mori Motonari. By the year 1517, the Sengoku period was in full swing. At this time, the young Mori Motonari was acting as guardian to the child Komatsumaru, the rightful head of the family and Motonari's nephew. However, with the chaos of the era continually rising, it was only a matter of time before the independence of the Mori came into question. For many years, they had maintained their connection to the Ochi clan, as did the Western Takeda who ruled over Aki. But in the fall of 1517, the Western Takeda, growing ambitious, broke away from the Ochi and set out to crush the Mori at Yoshida Koriyama. It is estimated that the Western Takeda army numbered around 5,000 strong, while Mori Motonari was only able to sally out with perhaps around 1,000. They met at the Battle of Arita Nakaide, Motonari's first battle, and his first victory. Surprisingly, against all odds, Motonari found success after his archers were able to slay both of the Takeda commanders, in the end routing the Takeda army. With the western Takeda leadership now in tatters, Motonari would seize the advantage of their upheaval and set out to begin conquering the rest of Aki over the coming years, winning fame and glory to his name. In 1523, his nephew and head of the family, Komatsumaru, would pass away. A most auspicious event as Motonari now inherited total leadership of the clan himself. Up until 1525, he had switched his allegiance, working closely with the Amago clan who had become another rising power in the west. But following 1525, we see that Motonari would return his loyalty to his old overlords, the Ochi. Around 15 years later, in 1540, the Amago would come for the Mori and attempt a massive siege of Motonari's power base at Yoshida Koriyama. And it would have likely succeeded too were it not for the aid of the Ochi who arrived with a fresh army in time to drive off the Amago forces in early 1541. This was then followed up by a massive Ochi and Mori combined siege of the Amago power base of Gasan Toda. However, Gasan Toda was one of the strongest fortifications in the west and would not fall easily. After a year of hard sieging, the exhausted attackers would be set upon by Amago forces as they charged out of the castle to take the fight to the Mori and Ochi. Both attacking armies were forced to retreat, resulting in massive casualties. The losses were so bad that the Ochi Daimyo, Ochi Yoshitaka would refuse to ever go to war again after this defeat. By 1544, Motonari allowed his third son to be adopted into the Kobayakawa family. Henceforth, he would be known as Kobayakawa Takakage. While three years later, in 1547, his second son would be adopted into the Kikawa clan, becoming Kikawa Motoharu. Following these diplomatic successes in the 1540s, Mori Motonari had secured the majority of Aki province. Thus, by this point, he had essentially become a Sengoku daimyo. In 1551, Sue Harukata, a prominent vassal of Ochi Yoshitaka, who had become disgruntled with Yoshitaka, decided to betray and usurp him. This would then later lead to Harukata taking military action against the Mori, 
paving the way towards the 1555 Battle of Miyajima, in which Motonari would trap Harukata's army on the holy island of Miyajima and destroy him there. The door was now open for Motonari to invade the former Ochi provinces, which he did, securing most of their old territories by 1557, greatly expanding his own domain. He would even continue on to launch new campaigns into Kyushu, battling hard against the Otomo clan. But in that same year, he would also step back as the official head of the Mori family, giving leadership over to his eldest son, Mori Takamoto. However, Motonari in actuality still held ultimate power over the clan. Takamoto's reign would unfortunately be a short one when he died unexpectedly in 1563. Motonari was said to be highly distraught after the death of his son, even suspecting that there might have been some foul play involved. In the end, Takamoto's young son and Motonari's grandson, Mori Teremoto, would become the new official head of the clan. By the early 1560s, Motonari was now back at war with the Amago clan after the death of Amago Haruhiza. This would result in a hard-fought campaign, followed by a second brutal siege of Gasan Toda in 1566, after which the Amago would fall into decline. With the Amago pacified, we can truly see that Motonari and his Mori clan had come to dominate all of western Honshu, the Chugoku region. However, this leads us right into 1568, when back to the east, Oda Nobunaga had just seized the imperial capital Kyoto. It was only a matter of time before these two powerhouses would come to blows. Nobunaga had restored Shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki to power, but in actuality, Yoshiaki would be nothing more than a puppet figurehead. Thus, in aims to break free from the shackles of the Oda, Yoshiaki began sending out calls for aid in expelling Nobunaga from the capital. These calls for aid went famously to the Takeda and to the Mori. And although the Takeda would inevitably take up the call to war, Mori Motonari decided otherwise. For one reason or another, he instead turned down Yoshiaki's pleas, and instead aimed to keep good relations with the Oda, as it is suggested that Motonari recognized the strategic competence of Nobunaga. Yet, Motonari's legendary reign was at last coming to an end. In June of 1571, Motonari would pass away at the age of 75. And it is said that even Nobunaga would send an envoy to express his condolences at the loss of the great lord of the west. This was likely the last time the Oda and Mori were on good terms. By the time of Motonari's death, the Mori had become one of the mightiest powers in the entire country, not only ruling over the Chugoku region, but also exerting their influence through the Kono clan in Shikoku and clashing with the Otomo in Kyushu. Motonari had left the clan in a great place of stability, binding his sons and grandsons together with lessons that their true strength lies in unity. This is where we get the famous story of the Three Arrows, something which is depicted in Kurosawa's 1985 classic, Ran. It is here that I should also add that with the Mori's dominance of the West also came their control of the Inland Sea, which the Mori dominated through the growing strength of their naval presence. Teremoto eventually saw the growing strength of Nobunaga as a threat, and with Nobunaga's new war against the Ikoiki monks of Ishiyama Honganji and other sects, Teremoto began to aid the Oda's enemies. This initially came in the form of using the Mori navy to help supply Ishiyama Honganji, as the massive temple fortress had been besieged by the Oda on land, the only way to get fresh supplies in was by sea. Soon enough, this would lead to all-out war between the Mori and Oda. The first major clashes between the two would be some of samurai history's largest naval battles at Kizugawaguchi, the first of which the Mori would win in 1576. Yet the Oda would be back for a second round in 1578, this time with better ships that broke the Mori navy. Without the aid of the Mori by sea, Ishiyama Honganji would fall in 1580. By this point, Oda generals Hashiba Hideyoshi and Akechi Mitsuhide were pushing west against the Mori on land, with Hideyoshi winning scores of impressive sieges against Mori allies. This was eventually leading up to the siege of Bichu Takamatsu in 1582, an example of one of Hideyoshi's famous flood attacks. 
Yet now, Hideyoshi had pushed deep into the Mori heartland, and was at risk of being crushed by a massive combined Mori army under the command of Terumoto. In need of reinforcements for the battle ahead, Hideyoshi sent word to Nobunaga, who agreed and began to move west himself. However, as we all know, it was here, as Nobunaga was just setting out on his journey to link up with Hideyoshi, that he would be betrayed and assassinated by Akechi Mitsuhide at the Temple of Honoji. Initially, Mitsuhide had sought to ally himself with the Mori in aims to rid himself of Hideyoshi, yet the messenger he had dispatched was intercepted by Hideyoshi's forces. Learning of Nobunaga's death, Hideyoshi came to Teremoto with the prospects of a truce. Teremoto would agree, thus allowing Hideyoshi to return east and defeat Mitsuhide at the Battle of Yamazaki. In the coming years, we see the rise of Hideyoshi, who would later take the name Toyotomi. Close ties between Teremoto and Hideyoshi would be strengthened as the Toyotomi would go on to secure the remnants of the Oda faction. Hideyoshi had become Nobunaga's successor and was determined to unite the land under his rule. With Teremoto and Hideyoshi on relatively good terms, the Mori would essentially come to work for the new Toyotomi regime, while keeping much of their land and dominance over the west. Mori forces would aid in Hideyoshi's invasions of Shikoku, Kyushu, and importantly the eventual invasion of Korea after Hideyoshi had initially unified Japan in 1590. Throughout the 1590s, Teremoto decided to move the main power base of the Mori from Yoshida Koriyama Castle to a more central and logistical position in Aki Province. The area he settled on was originally called Gokamura, an area that was comprised of five separate villages. It was here that he decided to construct his new impressive castle and join the surrounding towns together. The new name of this area would be called Hiroshima, and the castle would be completed by 1599. As Hideyoshi grew older, by the mid-1590s he would name Terumoto as one of the Gotairo, the five regions in charge of governing the country after Hideyoshi's death and seeing to the upbringing of Hideyoshi's son and heir, Hideyori. And it is here, after the death of Hideyoshi in 1598, that Japan would start to splinter once again, as Tokugawa Ieyasu, one of the strongest lords in the entire country, and another member of the Council of Regents, began making moves to assert his dominance. Initially, Teremoto had resolved to side with Ieyasu, perhaps because he believed it was not worth it to fight a war against the clan that had become the strongest power in the land following the death of Hideyoshi. Yet in the end, one of Teremoto's oldest and most trusted counselors, a figure named Ankokuji Eike, convinced Teremoto that Ieyasu's intentions were indeed devious, and that Teremoto should stand by the Toyotomi family. Teremoto was won over by this argument and would side with Ishida Mitsunari's western army. Being that Teremoto ruled over the largest and most powerful portion of the western army, Mitsunari decided to name him the commander-in-chief of the army. However, this really meant nothing, as after seizing Osaka Castle, Mitsunari would tell Teremoto to stay there, instead of leading his troops at the front. This was seen by the Mori and Mori loyalists as a dishonor to Teremoto, and would cause many of them to sit out of the Battle of Sekigahara, which the Western Army would lose. After this defeat, since the Mori had sided with the Western Army but not participated really in the battle, they were spared the loss of all of their land, and instead their territory was just massively reduced, as Ieyasu would leave the Mori with only Suo and Nagato provinces, depriving them of their new castle in Hiroshima which had just been completed the previous year. They were also branded as Tozama, outsider daimyo. After this devastating course of events, Teremoto retired as head of the clan, handing leadership over to his son Hidenari. Throughout the Edo period, the Mori would continue to govern over their territory, which had come to be known as Choshu Domain. During the Bakumatsu era, they had become staunchly anti-Tokugawa, and by 1866, a prominent samurai from Tosa by the name of Sakamoto Ryoma helped bring together Choshu with their old rival, the Shimazu, of Satsuma Domain, in what was known as the Sacho Alliance. Being that they were both Tozama Daimyo, who held resentment towards the Tokugawa Shogunate, 
the fires of revolt were rising. And two years later, with the outbreak of the Boshin War, Choshu forces would be on the forefront of the fighting, aiding in toppling the Shogunate and restoring the Emperor Meiji to ultimate power. From this victory, the army of Choshu would be instrumental in establishing the new Imperial Army. Following the abolition of the Han system through which the Shogunate had ruled, Daimyo Mori Takachika would be the first to give up his land, returning it back to the control of the Emperor. Through the Imperial Japanese era, the family would live on as Kazoku, those with exalted lineage. And to this day, the Mori name still continues. The story of the Mori is one of perseverance. They emerged as one of the mightiest families during the Sengoku Jidai, as through their legendary lord, Mori Motonari, they would come to dominate the West, ascending to being one of the mightiest forces throughout the entire period. And although they found themselves on the wrong side at the Battle of Sekigahara, centuries later they would avenge themselves, helping win the Boshin War and laying the heavy groundwork for the establishment of the Imperial Japanese Army. We can also not forget about their role in the establishment of the city of Hiroshima, which may not exist were it not for the power base they built there in the late Sengoku period. And it is here I'm never going to miss an opportunity to plug Hiroshima Castle, which although was destroyed following the atomic bombing of the city in 1945, was later rebuilt and now serves as a fascinating museum into the feudal past of Hiroshima and the Mori family. I recommend anyone traveling in Japan to check out this castle. I was able to visit it back in 2019 and didn't miss an opportunity to pick up a Mori banner from the gift shop, which I now have hung up in my house. An awesome reminder of not only my travels, but also the power the Mori once held in the West. So, with that all said, if you would like a say in which clan I cover the history of next, please consider joining the channel's Patreon, where you can gain access to exclusive polls where you can vote and suggest on which clans I cover going forward. Additionally, I also want to once again thank this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Don't miss your chance on an amazing offer on your very own virtual private network. Yet, as always, thank you for watching and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.